Hello, I'm Gabriel Sutherland, a undergraduate student at Oregon State University. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my project to develop a autonomous space debris remediation spacecraft. So first off, why even care about space debris? Well, there is a lot of stuff in space. And even though space is fairly large, it's getting more crowded all the time. Um, this image shows just tracked active satellites in orbit. When you add in space debris, it gets quite a bit more crowded. And this is just the stuff we can track. There's a lot of debris in orbit that's too small for ground-based radar to accurately track. Um, and for those, we just have to rely on computer models to estimate where those might be in orbit. Um, and those can be generated by all sorts of things, including spacecraft collisions. This is a um, video demonstrating the likely cloud of space debris generated by a uh, satellite collision between a Iridium communication satellite and a defunct Russian satellite a couple years back. Um, this uh, debris is highly energetic, but it's too small for ground-based radar to track, so we have to use computer modeling to predict where it is in orbit at any given time. When you add in all the other debris that we know to be in orbit, uh, it gets crowded fairly quickly. Um, this infographic shows the general distribution of objects in near Earth orbit uh, at lower orbital altitudes, like where the ISS resides. It's not super crowded, but as you get um, into higher orbits, it gets crowded fairly quickly. There are two distinct peaks in this main group of um, objects in near Earth orbit. One of the peaks is from the debris cloud um, from that uh, satellite collision I just showed you a video of, and the other is from a debris cloud generated by an anti-satellite weapons test back in 2007. So what happens if it, one of these small pieces of uh, highly energetic debris were to impact uh, another satellite? For example, one of the armor uh, tiles on the outside of the ISS. Um, researchers at Johnson Space Center wanted to provide a good visual representation of what that might look like. So they uh, launched a half ounce plastic cylinder at a block of aluminum at roughly 17 and a half thousand miles per hour. And this was the result. As you can see, it's a very energetic collision. Um, it's a pretty similar result when you use a small metal piece of debris instead of a small plastic piece of debris. Um, if you get even smaller than that though, um, for example, a micrometeorite or a piece of dust, uh, you can still uh, do damage even with the debris being that small. Uh, this is an image taken from one of the windows on the ISS a few years back uh, after one of the astronauts observed uh, that the window was chipped. And they suspect this to be from a uh, micrometeorite or a, a piece of dust or a paint fleck that came off of something. Um, and this was the result on a transparent aluminum window. If something like this were to impact a uh, solar panel or a communications array, the damage might be a bit more pronounced. So other than losing good satellites uh, to uh, collisions, why else worry about space debris? Well, there was a um, JPL scientist, Dr. Kessler, uh, who has a uh, a condition known after him now, Kessler syndrome. And the idea is that you could eventually get a cascade of debris in orbit where a collision causes debris, which cause uh, other impacts, which cause more debris and eventually get this cascade of debris in orbit where entire orbital planes are left too dangerous to operate in, which could have an impact on um, communications equipment in orbit, uh, science missions and navigation systems like GPS. Um, if those orbital planes were to be compromised by such a debris cascade. The possibility is remote, but with the amount of objects in Earth orbit increasing, uh, the rate and the chance that something like this could happen also increases. Uh, so there are a couple different uh, proposed methods for mitigating the space debris risk. One of them is uh, to clean up the stuff that's already up there, which is um, well, this project was investigating one possible avenue of doing that. Um, the satellite proposed in this method um, is fairly small, it's fairly lightweight, um, and it's designed to kind of uh, like a catcher's mitt wrap around um, a piece of debris. Um, but uh, an interesting thing about this um, 
particular proposal is that it would be autonomous and the um, intercept of space debris and the deorbit maneuvers of uh, the space debris once captured would be controlled via a, an autonomous um, navigation system on board the spacecraft. And the spacecraft uh, has a orbital uh, adjustment system that allows it to change orbits uh, without using uh, chemical propellant. And this is accomplished via a interaction with the Earth's geomagnetic field, which extends fairly far out into space. Um, the spacecraft would take advantage of a force known as the Lorentz force, um, which is essentially uh, the force imparted on a charged particle as it moves through a magnetic field. So if the satellite were to generate a uh, charge as it traveled through the Earth's magnetic field, the magnetic field would impart a force on the satellite. Uh, this electromotive force, if you are able to control the direction that this force vector is pointed in, could be reliably used to change the orbit of the satellite. Uh, it's fairly simple to do this if you have a simple dipole uh, magnetic field. And while the Earth does generally behave as a dipole with a north and south pole, there's also a lot of interesting elements in the geomagnetic field that uh, make it a bit more complicated than just a simple dipole. Um, in addition to that, um, space weather, such as solar flares, can also change the size, intensity, and strength of uh, the geomagnetic field of the geomagnetic field at different altitudes. Uh, we have been mapping the geomagnetic field for a long time uh, using instruments on board spacecraft, so we have a pretty good idea of the overall intensity, the declination of the field at different points, as well as the inclination. Um, Using all of this data, uh, you can create a fairly reliable map that uh, when incorporated into a navigation system for a Lorentz augmented orbit spacecraft uh, can provide for reliable navigation of the Earth's geomagnetic field. Uh, when you take the uh, Lorentz force equation and you incorporate it into the equations for orbital motion and you uh, derive the X, Y, and Z components of that uh, combination, you arrive at um, the equations shown on this slide. Uh, these equations would allow for a Lorenz spacecraft to reliably uh, effect orbit transfers uh, and orbital changes uh, as it orbits the Earth within the geomagnetic field. Um, however, computing those uh, orbital maneuvers would be fairly computationally intensive uh, to the point where since the thrust produced by uh, such a propulsion system is fairly low, uh, and you need a fairly long uh, transfer window where you're uh, providing thrust. Um, you would need to have um, fairly consistent uh, telemetry connection with the spacecraft, which makes operating such a spacecraft very expensive. So I began investigating whether such a um, navigation system could be automated and simplified, uh, become more computationally um, accessible to potentially just even run it on the hardware that would exist on board the spacecraft. Uh, and I was inspired after coming across this work by Rohan Sood of uh, University of Alabama, where they demonstrated that a neural network could effectively uh, plot and um, navigate a home and transfer orbit between Mars and Earth. Now the home and transfer orbit is a fairly simple orbital maneuver in um, two dimensions. When you move up to uh, a three-dimensional orbit transfer, such as um, trying to intercept something in a near-Earth orbit, uh, a neural network doesn't cut it anymore. You need to um, use something a bit more complex. For example, a deep reinforcement learning um, algorithm where you have a deep neural network interacting with an environment and learning from uh, the actions it takes in the environment um, in order to uh, computationally effect, uh, efficiently uh, navigate its environment in a safe and reliable manner. What I ended up coming with, coming up with for this particular problem um, is based on deep Q learning and it's specifically a deep deterministic policy gradient. Um, the environment I've been working with is a physics-based uh, orbital mechanics simulation where I plot uh, a orbital intercept maneuver 
using the Lorentz force equations uh, for uh, orbital movement um, in one simulation. And then in a concurrent simulation, there is a, a deep reinforcement learning agent that is trying to um, mimic essentially that same um, uh, orbital maneuver. Uh, the setup for this is fairly typical for a deep reinforcement learning um, algorithm um, using deep Q learning. Although there are um, one or two things about this particular setup that have allowed it to work fairly well in simulations. Um, the most significant of these is the choice to incorporate experience replay memory. Uh, and the reason that this was chosen was because experience replay, instead of running um, the, the learning process on uh, state action pairs as they occur during the simulation, uh, the system stores the data uh, that it discovers uh, for the state action reward and next state. Uh, from there, the learning phase is then separate from gaining experience. Uh, there are two main advantages to this. One of them is that you are able to make more efficient use of previous experience by learning with it multiple times. Uh, this is key as gaining real world experience is extremely costly, such as in the example of uh, orbital mechanics for uh, orbital intercepts. Uh, the other key advantage for experience replay memory is uh, that you get better convergence behavior when you're training a function approximator as we are here for Lorentz force uh, orbital equations. Um, in simulations, the agent has been trained to the point where it's able to uh, fairly reliably and fairly efficiently effect orbit transfers and orbit intercepts. Um, in this case, the agent was attempting to intercept a uh, satellite in geosynchronous orbit, uh, and it was able to plot an intercept uh, maneuver for, for that from low Earth orbit. Uh, you may no notice, though, that the uh, path that it's taking up to the higher orbital altitude, um, as it moves away from the Earth, it begins to get a bit wobbly. Uh, this is because the deep reinforcement learning agent is attempting to approximate uh, the path that was plotted out um, by the um, actual equations for uh, orbital motion. Um, it, the, the more I've trained uh, this particular um, iteration of the deep reinforcement learning agent, uh, the smaller the magnitude of those deviations away from the optimal uh, path, uh, but they, they are still there. Uh, when you're talking about a spacecraft using a chemical propellant, where you have a finite amount of propellant you can bring with you, um, waste like that is unacceptable. But when you're talking about a spacecraft that's able to recharge its electrical systems using an RTG or solar, and then convert that electricity into more propulsion, um, waste like that is still an issue, but it less so. Um, Ultimately, the goal would be to eliminate that altogether if possible. Uh, to train this um, agent, I've been running my simulations on um, a NVIDIA DGX workstation at Oregon State University. Uh, the goal is to ultimately uh, slim this down to the point where it would be able to run on hardware that you might see on a CubeSat in low Earth orbit. So to that end, I've been uh, conducting research and designing a a hardware layout for what you might see uh, for a satellite. I've taken inspiration from uh, the European Space Agency's FISAT that they uh, launched recently, which utilizes Intel Movidius technology for Earth observation. Um, for testing the uh, debris capture mechanism, I will soon be testing it in a vacuum chamber that just arrived uh, this past month at Oregon State University. Um, and we will be testing both that and the navigation system on a uh, CubeSat that we will be manufacturing at some point in the next year. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Bradley Camburn, uh, my colleagues Frank and Thanos, as well as my mentor, Dr. Nancy Squires. Thank you for your time.